If you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, please. We'll begin reading there. The Lord Jesus in verse 9 says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 14, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Let's pray. Our heavenly Father, we come before you and ask your mercy upon us in the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your word is preached, You will use the preacher for your glory alone and that the people in the hearing of the word preached will be dealt with according to the truth of your word. That the spirit of God will deal with all of our souls. Please, Lord, do not leave us to ourselves. Do not leave us in wondering wandering minds. Lord, will you grant us focus that we will listen with clarity and understanding that the word may be applied to our souls. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We've come to the section of the Lord's Prayer that are the fourth and fifth, six petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Last week we looked at give us this day our daily bread and today we will continue and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Even as we come to this one single passage, it's good to remember the importance of connections. We're not just left with just this one phrase as a standalone phrase, the Lord Jesus has been building up to this time. He's been plainly telling the Pharisees of their own self-righteousness leading them to destruction. Their own willingness to continue to think that their way is right. Constantly, consistently living a life to prove themselves as righteous. The Lord Jesus says no. You're not righteous in and of yourself. And even your prayer, the way you pray, reflects your view of your self-righteousness. And he turns to his own disciples and says, pray in this way. And the way of our prayer is not a prayer of self-righteousness. It's a prayer of submission to the one living holy God. Bowing before him, submitting to him, submitting to him in his being, his essence, who he is, what he has done, in his sovereignty, all that he is. And then bowing to him in daily matters of life. One writer says, it does not matter how desperate our problems, it does not matter how acute the tension, it does not matter how suddenly they have confronted us, we must never fail to observe the order taught here in the Lord's Prayer. What is that order? God first, even in prayer. God focus first, even in prayer. And our daily needs second. It is when we look at it in that way that we see how utterly valueless much of our praying must be. Lloyd-Jones goes on and he says, All our needs are summed. Our whole life is found in these three petitions. Speaking of the last three. 
in such small compass as covered the whole life of the believer. He wants us to, to really focus God first and God first in all that we do, even in our prayer, and then we can pray these petitions in daily life. We must notice as we move through this prayer that we've gone from the focus of thy will or your will be done, God. The second person, plural or singular, to the context of the first person, plural, us. But it started there and moved downward. As one writer says, this covers life in every respect. Our present day, our past debt, and our future deliverance. If you look at the context of these next few verses, it's give us this day our daily bread. And verse 12, and forgive us our debts. And then it asks... Don't give us into temptation. These petitions give us the context, as one writer says, that sin complicates everything. I mean, we look at the world around us and we recognize that all the troubles that are in the world are due to sin. And this is the problem of the world. The world does not want to stop and bow to the one holy God and say, we have sinned against you. The world keeps trying to fight through and act as if, in a man-centered way, we can solve every problem of the world. But not so for the believer. The disciple of the Lord Jesus is pointed directly by Christ himself to recognize Everything is God-focused, even that which is of daily life, and it all draws down to these issues of daily life that have been complicated by sin. And if it weren't for the sin of men and women all over the world throughout all time, space, and history, we wouldn't have to worry about our daily bread. Why? Because in the garden it was before them. They didn't have to pray and ask and, and, and plead in some way to think of God as their provider in that way because it was right there before them. And now, beyond just looking around and giving thanks for daily bread, we're confronted with the fact that we are in need of forgiveness. The disciple recognizes this. The, the, the repentant believer in the Lord Jesus Christ recognizes their need for forgiveness and so therefore they can pray in this way. One writer said, the first three petitions of this prayer catch us up to heaven. The latter three call us down to earth. Thomas Manton said, the petitions may be thus ranked. The first four concern the obtaining of good, and the last two, the removal of evil. Well, this brings us to this fifth petition this morning, and it brings us to two all-important questions. Why do we need forgiveness, and what is forgiveness? Why do we need forgiveness, and what is forgiveness? Now, in order to answer these two questions, I'm going to rehearse some material that I preached last year in the spring. Uh, I did a series on forgiveness. Many of you may remember that. It's unlikely that you remember absolutely everything I said. Some of you are good note takers and you may recognize, well, he said that before. Some of you, I know, make notes in the margins of your Bibles at certain texts. So I will rehearse some information I've rehearsed before. But you know that's a good thing, right? You know the old illustration about the preacher that went to the church, the new preacher for the first time? He preached this sermon. Everybody loved it. On the way out the door, they thanked him and thanked him and thanked him. The next week, he showed up, and you know what he did? He preached the same exact sermon. He did that three weeks in a row. 
there was an elderly gentleman who came to him after the third week and he said, you know, Pastor, you've preached the same exact sermon three weeks in a row. The pastor looked at him and said, well, when we get this one right, I'll move on. <laughs> so repetition can be good. So even though we may rehearse some of those things, some of this repetition will be necessary, it will be good, and it's always be good to be reminded of some of those things. Well, let's look at this first question. Why do we need forgiveness? Why do we need forgiveness? There are many different thoughts as to the need for forgiveness. The Lord Jesus says we're supposed to pray this way and forgive us our debts. Why would we pray that way? Well, many people think that forgiveness is about relationships with other individuals, whether it's a work context, it's in the family. It's always very man-centered, very horizontal in the context of the world. Some people say, well, we need it in society. There was one study that showed 62% of Americans agreed, strongly or somewhat, that they need more forgiveness in their personal lives. And this number increases to 83% in their communities, 90% in America, and 90% in the world. So in essence, there are at least 90% of people in America that think forgiveness would be really, really good throughout their lives, personally, in their work, throughout the culture, society, and forgiveness would be great in the world. Then there's other people that they don't even really have an idea of what they need to be forgiven of. A reporter asked President Donald Trump before he was elected, if asking for forgiveness is a central tenet in his faith and life. He said, quote, I try not to make mistakes where I have to ask forgiveness, end quote. Then he goes on and says, why do I have to repent or ask forgiveness if I am not making mistakes? I work hard. I'm an honorable person. He goes on when further asked about repentance to say, I think repenting is terrific. Well, the issue here is greater than just a personal relationship or concern or even a global cultural hate crisis. Some people are not even sure if forgiveness is necessary and they don't even know what it is or why they need it. You can have people say forgiveness is of great importance and we need it, but can they define it? Do they really understand it? Do they understand why they would even need it? Some people would put it in a category to say it's only about mistakes. I work hard. I'm a good person. I do my part for society. I, I, I get out there by the sweat of my brow and I do this. I, I put it to the plow. I do this. I do that. And I try not to make mistakes. I'm not harassing President Trump or former President Trump, but his mentality is one that is all across not only the nation but the world. People think forgiveness is somehow about just mistakes. Well, if we agree with most Americans, we would say that the topic of forgiveness is a good and necessary topic and it's a good starting point. Even though we know most people don't understand forgiveness and what it is, there's a lot that has been written and said about it. Just go home and do a quick Google search. Put the word forgiveness in, and you'll see there's been a lot that's been said and written about forgiveness. And if you spend too much time reading it, you'll begin to realize a lot of it is a bunch of gobbledygook. They don't really get it. They don't really understand it. Most of them think it's merely about human relations. But actually the topic of forgiveness concerns issues at a more base level. Not human relations, but human existence. There's a big difference. It's not just about human relations. 
You know, a lot of companies have human relations or human resources departments. We're all about human relations. But the issue of forgiveness is a topic that really is about human existence. It gets to something very core. And even it gets to the issue of human non-existence. Really, we ought to be asking questions in dealing with forgiveness like this. Who are we before the one holy God? What do we owe him? And even subsequently, the topic begs questions of what happens to a person after death. Now, I know death is a dark subject, and it's not something we like to talk about very often. And if people just want to talk about death all the time, you, you kind of wonder about them a little bit. On the other hand, death is a base fact on this earth. Every human that wants to talk about human relations really has to deal with human existence. And there's one fact that goes throughout all cultures, all societies, all nations, all of history, all of time. People are born and people die. Since everyone will be faced with their own mortality, then the importance of facing, facing death truly accentuates the matter of forgiveness. Forgiveness deals with the complication, complications of mankind's relationships or relationship to God first, then to other humans. It also deals with death and what happens after a person dies. So forgiveness is a discussion that has much greater implications than even a humanistic global perspective could imagine. We've got groups all over the world that are global groups for human rights, whether it's this group and uh, over here that is in New York or this group in Africa or this group in uh, you know, Eastern Europe. There's all types of groups that have been formed. They even have agencies. They've come up with world groups now. And we've been doing it for a long time. The League of Nations. Well, that's not the first time things like that have been tried. All those things in and of themselves are just trying to solve the problem on a horizontal level. Trying to get everybody to play nice in the same sandbox. You've watched some children play in the sandbox, haven't you? You've seen that there's some that they kind of sit in the corner of the sandbox to themselves, kind of do their own thing. And then there's one that no matter what you give them, they always seem to want to crawl over and start harassing the one that's not messing with anybody. And then you've got the one that kind of comes over there to try to make peace between the other two. And then after a while, you watch it, and all three of them are fussing at each other, or they're at least crying. Well, the world's that way. We're living all in the same sandbox. Everybody's got all of these issues around them, and there are different personalities, whether it's individually or it's corporate or it's culturally or whatever it may be. And at some point in time, it all just explodes. The issue of forgiveness is one that we cannot just leave on a horizontal level. The world has not solved that problem. I know I've said that to you many times before, but I think it bears repeating. Stop looking to the culture to solve your problems. You've got to look to, to Christ through the scripture. And I just say that plainly because I, I know I've been there. I'm reading this article or watching this news station or looking at this thing, that and the other, and I'm trying to figure it out. As if somebody's actually going to listen. As Christians, we have to have a different perspective. We've got to stop looking to the culture and the world 
to give us hope and comfort. Because what we need is not forgiveness from people around us, first and foremost. We need to understand forgiveness granted by a holy God, given to us on the basis of our standing in Christ alone and nothing else. That's it. That's it. Does the scripture give us a context to understand that forgiveness is more than something horizontal? Yeah, it does. Just in a, in a broad sense, if you just take what the Bible gives us in, in, a, in a very broad context, if we were just to survey it just briefly for a moment, think about all the people in scripture that sin against God and the issue that they have in their life is their sin against God, and that's what the scripture is trying to tell you. Even as we have been reading through 1 Samuel, what are we seeing with Saul? The issue with Saul is, is he's trying to solve a problem on a horizontal human relation level. God gives him a command. When he goes to carry out the command against the Amalekites, what does he do? He starts listening more to the people than he does the command of God. sounded very harsh for God to say to destroy, utterly destroy the Amalekites, didn't it? You read that by itself and you're like, man, I thought God was a God of grace. I thought he was a God of love. I thought he was nice. But when you read the history of the Amalekites over centuries, the Amalekites were not only, not only a people group, a nation, or a nomadic group that sought to harass, kill, and maim the people of Israel. And they did it oftentimes uh, in unethical ways. I mean, picture the people of Israel coming out of Egypt. They've been traveling for miles. They're stragglers behind. Weaker women and children struggling to keep up with the main group. And the Amalekites are coming and picking them off. Killing them. Maybe kidnapping them. They came against the Israelites time and time again, but the greatest thing they did was they set their hand against the holy God. God's command to Samuel wasn't, uh, excuse me, to Saul was not something arbitrary. His command was not something he just thought up in the moment and went, you know what? I'm, I don't know about these Malachites. Let's just kill them off. No. He was bringing about judgment on a nation that had been set against him for hundreds of years. And yet Saul didn't want to listen to God. He was more concerned with what the people were going to say. The people wanted the good livestock. And the way they justified it was, as well, we can make sacrifices to our God. God said, no, I told you to utterly destroy. Oftentimes for us, we don't realize in our own lives that we are much like the people of Israel. We're constantly wanting to justify our movement, our action in some way, even though it's, it may be just a little bit off the mark. Instead of just doing exactly plainly what God said to do. This is the problem with the world. The world wants to so focus on their lives that they're not recognizing that they've sinned against a holy God. And the Bible gives the world and us plenty of these examples, not just Saul. But 
it gives us examples of people like Abraham and David. A person by the name of Saul of Tarsus. What would Saul have been like had it not been the, the regenerating power of God to change his soul? Maybe it would have gone from standing by and holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen to him becoming the greatest of the murderers of God's people. Well, it brings us to a place to understand not only why we need forgiveness, but what is forgiveness. We need forgiveness because we've sinned against a holy God. In every aspect of our lives, we have sinned against a holy God. And if sin is not real, then forgiveness is not necessary. Well, what is forgiveness? Well, in a succinct statement, this may not seem succinct to you, but it was the most succinct I could get. Forgiveness is the release from and the abolition of the ultimate debt owed by a person to the one and only sovereign God. Forgiveness is the release from and the abolition of the ultimate debt owed by a person to the one and only sovereign God. Forgiveness, first of all, is a release from this ultimate debt owed by us to God. Now, how is it that we owe God a debt? Well, it's through the context of something called federal headship. What does that mean? That means the idea of representation. You know what representation is, right? We're all good Americans. Uh, representation means that you have somebody who represents you in our state government or our national government. You vote that person into uh, that place and they go and represent you. Now, do those representatives always do what you want them to do? I don't see a lot of head shaking, but I know on the inside you're all going, no. They don't. They don't do what you want them to do. Well, in the context here, it's not just about uh, voting someone in as a representative, but God made the representative for mankind when he created Adam and Eve. And that creation by God was better than allowing us to elect our own representation. It was the good and right holy God who created that representation or the representative for mankind because God himself in his word says when he created man, what? It is good. He is good. You and I could never make a perfectly good choice. But the one true living God did and can create the perfectly good representative. And he did in Adam. He created a good representative. He's good. Now he created him in a state of innocence that Adam in and of himself had a true free will, the ability to obey God and the ability to disobey God. He did create him with that true free will in obedience to God. Adam having that ability to obey God or disobey God, he chose to disobey God. That's what the scripture teaches us. Eve ate of the fruit, came and gave it to Adam, and Adam ate of the fruit. He had the ability to say no. She had the ability to say no. And they did not. Ultimately, though, it's Adam's sin that has passed all of this down to the posterity of humanity. 
in this federal headship or this representation of Adam, it gives us the context for understanding this ultimate debt owed by a person to the one and only sovereign God. We need a release from that debt. We need that debt to be sent away. And that's what that word forgiveness here in uh, verse 12 means. It's the idea of sending it away. And forgive us our debts. If God left man in his state of that posterity granted to him through Adam, he would leave them in their sin. The only way for that debt to be solved is death. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. You want to know why death has entered the world? Why every single individual that's ever lived living now and will ever live is going to go through death it's because of sin now I want you to think about that for a minute because you hear that a lot and you've heard many of you not just in this church but you've heard it a lot probably if you've been in churches for a long time you've heard that idea taught to you but I want you to think about that context of actually viewing the world do you realize what the world is doing every day is fighting against the actual understanding of the purpose of all of the understanding of sin itself? There's a constant rebellion going on every day saying, I don't need forgiveness. I don't need your help, God. I don't really want to like you. I don't need you. You're not helpful for me. Go away. I'll do it my way. Watch me work. That idea from an individual basis moves forward into a corporate sense of how people, cultures, and life works. That's what they're saying every day. And what's happening every day? Every single day on this earth, people are dying. Why? Because sin is real. That's why they're dying. Sin is real. Well, I want to be a better person. I'll be nicer. Let me work on myself. I tell you what, if I just do me, then I'll be a better person, and you can do you, and you be a better person. All our little phrases from commercials and everything else that we get, all these little things from celebrities and athletes and, and newspaper, or excuse me, uh, I don't know if anybody reads a newspaper anymore, um, but online articles everywhere around us. It sounds good, but it means nothing except rebellion toward God. Because left to ourselves in humanity, our federal head, our representative is Adam and he gave to us. And it's been passed down through every single individual through all of time, space, and history. He gave to us a sin nature. We are conceived in sin from our mother's wounds. We love sin. We are born in it. And left to ourselves, we will stay in it. With that being the case, this ultimate debt that is owed, not only do we need a release from it, but we need it to be abolished. Well, thankfully, the Lord our God did not leave us to ourselves. He sent a federal head who was greater with a better ministry. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ.
The Lord Jesus Christ came and lived on this earth, born of the Virgin Mary, lived on this earth, walked a perfect life every single day, never even had a sinful thought. The very Son of God, walking and living on this earth among people just like you and I, who would give him pressure, who would cause him problems, who would uh, be a, a part of his temptation. And the scripture tells us he was tempted in every way. He was tempted in every way. And yet he never sinned. Not once. What the first Adam did not do, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he did it and accomplished it perfectly. Living a perfect life. But that's not just all he did. After living over 30 years on this earth, perfectly now, in everything, every thought, everything in his whole life, living perfectly. He taught the word of God rightly. He spoke the word of God rightly. He lived it rightly. He was ridiculed for it. He was hated. He was mistreated. And then you know what he did? He willingly died a sinner's death. He went to the cross. He walked there willingly. And through his shed blood, he became the once and only sacrifice. The debt of sin was paid for God's people. That not one of them would be lost. The federal headship is about representation. Through Christ, federal headship gives hope for reconciliation. That that sin debt would be sent away. That the wages of sin, that, that death itself, would be abolished. Do you understand it's only through Christ that one does not pay that final, ultimate debt? That death would be under the eternal torment and wrath of God? See, this is a question of human existence. Do you really understand what forgiveness is? It's not just about living a better life. It's not just about being nicer to people. It's not just about hoping everyone can live and play in the same sandbox together. This is about the very ultimate question of life and death. Without the Lord Jesus Christ coming, living, and shedding his blood on that cross, there would be no hope of forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Forgiveness is about being reconciled to the one holy God who we are at enmity against. That we have waged war against with the members of our body. can't think about forgiveness with each other in a complete or even really a, a proper context without understanding the forgiveness that is given by God to his people through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This reconciliation that God brings is the idea of what forgiveness in and of itself is all about. 
that one could be declared right before a holy God. That God would no longer look at them or look upon them as those who were in debt. And that debt had not been paid. This is more than just a financial debt. You know what those are. If you go to the store and you walk up to the cash register and they say, it's X amount of dollars and cents, and you say, I don't have that, but I'll still take the product. What's somebody going to say? Uh-uh. This is even more than that. It's as though you've been alerted to the fact that you don't have the money and now you take the product anyway and you walk out with it and say, it's mine. I'll do what I want. It went from being a financial debt to being a what? A moral debt. Because when you walk out with that product, as R.C. Sproul says, what's going to happen? They're going to call the police. And the police are doing what? They're dealing with the law. And once they arrest you, you're going to be brought before who? A judge. And the judge is going to render a judgment based upon what? The law. God has a law. How are you and I going to stand before him? Left to ourselves, we'll have nothing to offer him. Forgiveness is about something greater than just human relations. It's about our very existence on the face of this earth. And it deals with the very question that not one of us, not one of us can fully understand is the context of death. We know the truth of why it happens. But we certainly don't understand all that surrounds it. But there's only one answer to deal with death. And it's to answer two questions. Why do we need forgiveness? And what is forgiveness? And then thirdly, to consider, how do we get it? And we see that in the person and work of Christ. That's how we get it. Well, I'll leave you with three observations this morning. In the context of this prayer, when he says, and forgive us our debts, Luke's version says, forgive us our sins, or some of your versions say trespasses. Well, it's very specific here. He's not saying forgive us of something other than sin. It's saying forgive us of our sins. Firstly, remember to pray in submission to the Heavenly Father as one in need of forgiveness. President Trump's not the only one, but there are a lot of people that walk around this earth and they just think about mistakes, but they don't understand sin. When you go before the Lord Jesus according to the truth of this prayer, you need to pray Forgive us our debts because you understand you are in need of forgiveness. Do you get that? Or do you just think you're a basically good person? If you think you're a basically good person, then you've not understood the truth of the Scripture. The Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each one of us is a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. Far from it. Don't come looking to me to be your priest. I can't do it. I can't forgive you of anything. There's one priest, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are in need of forgiveness, and we need to pray that way. I think sometimes even as Christians, we can be somewhat flippant about this and just ask for forgiveness of something and not really stop and think that we've sinned against a holy God. We need to pray as those who need forgiveness. And that means submitting and bowing to the one true Heavenly Father and understanding we've sinned against Him first and foremost. Secondly, remember to pray in submission to the Heavenly Father for forgiveness of sin. Not, it's not about mistakes. 
You need to know and understand what you're asking of God. You're not asking him to just say, well, God, I made a little mistake over here. Can you just kind of take care of that? We need to get the cosmic understanding of this. It's not spilled water on a linoleum floor. You spill a little water on a linoleum floor and nobody's too concerned about that, right? You get a little rag, you wipe it up, it's water. No, this is asking God to forgive us our sins against him. God, I have sinned against you. I have rebelled against you. I have gone against you. Even in telling that white lie, I sinned against you, O oh God, creator of heaven and earth. Thirdly, remember to pray in submission to the Heavenly Father in relation to forgiving others. Remember to pray in submission to the Heavenly Father in relation to forgiving others. The Lord Jesus says in verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, is this saying that our forgiveness is based on our own works of righteousness and forgiving other people? No. You know what it's saying, though? A person who really understands their sin against a holy God and goes before him and pleads for forgiveness before him, they understand grace well enough that they will be willing to forgive others. And we could talk about the, the world not being willing to do this. But you know what? The problem's not necessarily with the world because the world doesn't understand any of this. It's you and I who profess faith in Christ that have to be the ones willing to forgive because we understand, hopefully, rightly, we understand what forgiveness is. That we owed a debt to God we couldn't pay. We sinned against him and God gave his grace to us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He abolished our debt through the shed blood of Christ. One pastor wrote some time ago something to this effect. It's amazing how those who talk so much of grace are often those who use it so little. Does the Lord Jesus not give us a parable of understanding of how we can misuse the grace of God and not forgive others? brings his prayer to a very practical state. We need to take seriously what it means to go before the Lord our God and ask forgiveness of sin against him, biblical sin. But furthermore, we need to be willing to understand that that forgiveness granted to us is a forgiveness we ought to walk with in working with others. In every facet of life, a spouse that says they know so much about grace and yet they can't be gracious to their husband or their wife. It goes in our working relationships, our relationships with our children. It's everywhere. There is a practical impact to this. And yet first and foremost, we have to understand the context of that forgiveness is in Christ alone. If we're not willing to forgive others, we're going to say a lot about our understanding of grace. 
and really maybe even the lack thereof. Let's not shout at the world and tell them to be more gracious because you know what? They don't understand grace. You can scream and I can scream at the TV or the radio as loud as I want to about the world or about my coworker or about this person or that person I have to deal with. But unconverted people don't understand the grace of God. So I can't expect them to live and act like anything else but unconverted people. The one who has to act, act like a Christ-centered person is the person who professes belief. And that person who professed belief has said, I have repented of my sin because I have been in need of forgiveness from a holy God for I sinned against him. It's you and I that need to show grace. It's you and I that need to show grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be merciful to us and kind. That we would take these things away and think rightly. Help us to understand, Lord, that forgiving those in the world doesn't mean that we have to agree with them. Will you give us minds and hearts to live and speak the truth in daily life? And yet when we are shouted down or hated, will you give us the ability to walk away in forgiveness? And to be those who consistently desire to live, speak the truth, and to forgive others their debts against us as you have forgiven us. We praise you for who you are and all that you've done through your son, the Lord Jesus. May we glory in him alone. It's in his name we pray. Amen.